everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Virtual Gaithersburg Book Festival. I'm Amy McGuire, and I'm your host for tonight's presentation. Before we get started, I'd like to ask you to please consider supporting these authors by purchasing their books from our wonderful bookseller partner, Politics and Prose. You'll find purchase links in the presentation description. Given all that we've been through over the past year, it's so important to support local and independent stores. I also want to extend a big thank you to our 2021 featured sponsor, the David and Michael Blair Family Foundation, for their generous support. Okay, let's begin. With us today are authors Nadia Hashimi and Sahar Mustafa to discuss their latest novels involving two women who must navigate the challenge and heartbreak of cultural divide. In Sparks Like Stars by Nadia Hashimi, an Afghan-American woman returns to Kabul to learn the truth about her family and the tragedy that destroyed their lives in this brilliant and compelling novel. Bold, illuminating, heartbreaking, yet hopeful, Sparks Like Stars is a story of home, of America and Afghanistan, tragedy and survival, reinvention and remembrance. Nadia is a pediatrician turned international best-selling author. Her novels for adults and children are inspired by the people and history of Afghanistan and have been translated into 16 languages. She is a member of the U.S. Afghan Women's Council, Montgomery County Commission on Health, and serves on the boards of several nonprofit organizations with focus on education, hunger, and civic engagement. In the Beauty of Your Face by Sahar Mustafa, a Palestinian American woman wrestles with faith, loss, and identity before coming face to face with a school shooter in this searing debut. The Beauty of Your Face is a profound and poignant exploration of one woman's life in a nation at odds with its ideals and an emotionally rich novel that encourages us to reflect on our shared humanity. Sahar Mustafa is the daughter of Palestinian immigrants, an inheritance she explores in her fiction. The Beauty of Your Face was named a 2020 notable book in editor's choice by the New York Times Book Review, a Los Angeles Times United We Read selection, one of Marie Claire Magazine's 2020 Best Fiction by Women, and a great group reads for National Reading Group Month. Her short story collection, Code of the West, was the winner of the 2016 Willow Books Fiction Award. Her stories have earned a distinguished story citation from Best American Short Stories 2016, first place in fiction from the Guild Literary Complex of Chicago, and three Pushcart Prize nominations, among other honors. Today's panel is moderated by Raja Hasid. Raja is the author of A Pure Heart, and in the language of miracles, which was a New York Times editor's choice and received an honorable mention from the Arab American Book Awards. She earned an MA in creative writing from Marshall University and has written for the New York Times Book Review and the New Yorker Online. Welcome Nadia, Sahar, and Raja. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you to the Gaithersburg Book Festival for arranging this. I am so excited to be here today and to talk to two of my favorite authors, mm -hmm. uh, Nadia and Sahar. Thank you so much for your books. I've loved them and I'm very excited to start talking about them. I have so many questions, so um, we'll just get started. Um, I want to start, I, I will, in a moment, I will ask you both to read a little bit of your novels because your prose is so beautiful and I think the audience needs to hear some of that, to appreciate it. But before we get there, can you uh, can we start with a little bit, um, just an introduction about the novel's titles? Because it struck me when I read them that both of your novels have uh, titles that, that are coded from um, a poem or a song. So Nadia, your title comes from a poem that you quote in the novel and Sahar, yours is from a song that a grandmother sings to the grandchildren. So, I'm curious, are the songs and the poem, are they real? Did you make them up? Is there a story behind this? And what did you want the titles to convey to the readers? So Nadia, do you want, do you want to uh, start and let us know? 
Sure, I'm sure I can start with that one. So, um, and uh, we're starting off with a question in which I must reveal my weakness, which is coming up with titles. <laughs> so I don't in general come up with the titles to my books. Um, but it's okay. I mean, I do the rest of, of the work of in between those two covers, right? So the titles to my book, actually, I've been really fortunate that my literary agent, Helen Heller, has been, she just has a knack for coming up with titles. And um, so with my previous books, the titles have come from poetry of Hafez, of Rumi. And in my mind for this book, I really was thinking I would love to use the poetry of an Afghan woman. And yet this wasn't something that I had yet spoken to Helen about. And, you know, one day out of the blue, I get a phone call from her. And she said, I'm in New York, I'm with your editor, and we're sitting here coming up with title ideas. And she says, how about Sparks Like Stars? And I thought, oh, there's something there. Um, but you know, when you hear a title initially, it doesn't really like make sense, but there's something about it. Um, and she said, it's a line from a poetry, uh, from, a, from a poem that was written by an Afghan woman. And I thought, well, there it is. Right? <laughs> and so, so it's a poem that's written by a woman who, uh, her name is Nadia Anjuman. And unfortunately, her life was cut short. Her, her, she was tragically murdered by her, by her, by her husband. Um, but in her short life, she was able to publish some really amazing works of poetry. And so this line, which really is one that talks about her angst and her pain, where she says um, that sighs, you know, spill from her or sparks spill from her sighs like stars. And so it's real or something to that effect. I, I'm, I'm probably bunching it, but um, but that's where it came from. And it just really made sense because it's what I wanted to represent in the story. It was the story of a woman of her anguish. And I was able to draw the, the title from from that poem. Excellent. That's 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 fascinating. And I can relate because I have a horrible time with titles as well. So I understand that. So how, how about yours? Yeah, uh, it's, it's a beautiful cover and title, uh, Nadia. Very, very lovely. So um, it was also my agent who, who actually pulled this, you know, from the novel. Uh, I had uh, I had suggested the declining day, which references uh, Salat al Asr. So it's that prayer, um, which is when the day begins to decline, not sunset. It's it's that time before then, and they thought it was too grim, and you know. It was one of these things where as, as soon as they called it, because I just wasn't seeing it, you know, I've always written short stories and they usually will come from an image, you know, something a character says. Um, I realized, wow, this, this actually really speaks to um, some, of, some of the themes about humanity, you know, how our faces are emblematic you know, of our humanity. So I, I thought it was perfect. And it didn't, it didn't um, set any sort of specific tone. Uh, and, and I'm surprised when people ask me, so that, that's a detail they sometimes miss. So, uh, you know, they've read it and then they forget that it comes from that Bosnian song that the grandmother sings to her grandchildren. So does the song actually exist? Is it a real yes. song? Yes, yes. I was actually doing research when I was working on the character of Bilal, who's mm -hmm. from the Balkans, and, and that came up. And mm -hmm. it was so beautiful because it was also Islamic. And I, again, I just thought, you know, how lucky am I? And and again, you know, j just to depict a relationship, really. But then, of course, what, what became the title then of, of the novel? Well, it's beautiful. They're both beautiful titles and beautiful covers. Um, so, uh, excellent. Um, what can we, uh, would you both mind um, reading a little bit from the novel? Nadia, do you want to start with, with a little bit of a reading before we uh, jump into the rest of the uh, conversation and discussion? And if you feel like you need to contextualize your reading or tell us a little bit about the novel, um, you can go ahead and do so. Sure. So I'm going to read from the prologue because, you know, no spoilers. So we'll just start from the beginning and the prologue hopefully sets the tone a bit for the novel. And and this is, you know, a novel that kicks off in 1978 in Kabul um, at the time of a coup. And that's an actual historical event. And um, there is a young girl who is a survivor and witness to that coup. So this book is really about her journey from that night um, and beyond. So this is just a section from the prologue. What are you? I have been asked as I pay for my coffee, as I check out a book at the library, as I explain to my last patient of the day how I will remove the tumor growing inside him, as if I am a species, not a person. 
People throw identities at me and look to see if one will stick. Greek, Italian, Lebanese, Argentinian, Eastern European. I trigger a railroad switch and divert their questions away from crates of ammunition and streams of pity and preserve for myself the first and only peaceful decade of my life. But untold histories live in shallow graves. Some nights, the cold wakes me and I find I've clawed my way out from under the covers. I count the stars to catch my breath. Once upon a time, a little girl with velvet ribbons in her hair crouched deep in the belly of a palace, tucked behind copper pots and urns and cartons heavy with treasures of a lost world. Each time she was shaken by the urge to scream, she plunged her teeth into the soft flesh of her forearm. She knew only that she should remain perfectly still and prayed no one would hear the thin echo of the song her father would sing when he would find her awake well past her bedtime. While I slumber, you are open-eyed. I am naive, but you are ever wise. Because of him, in spite of him, she did not wail in the dark. Meters above her, soldiers wandered, some solemnly and others less so, through the war and of hallways. Walls were marked with crimson splatters, the fingerprints of revolution. A general, feeling presidential, slid into a plush Victorian sofa and traced the curves of its lacquered arms. His chest puffed to think that people would soon come to appreciate the sacrifices he'd made tonight for the greater good. He stood and walked across a hand-knotted burgundy carpet, delicate white flowers laced through an elephant's foot motif. He checked the sole of his left boot, then his right. He needn't have worried, though. An Afghan carpet, perhaps by design, conceals blood just as well as it conceals spilled tea. The city, a halo around the palace, waited on an announcement from the president to explain the sight of Sukhoi jets and the sound of gunfire. American diplomats stationed in Kabul, some still fuzzy from cocktails, wondered what bizarre conflict had befallen their peaceful and exotic post. One silver-haired American woman teetering from the effects of a stubby cigarette she'd purchased off a hippie couple tried to touch the paper airplanes that soared over her head. She applauded the flash of fireworks, as Americans do. Never, that little girl in the palace knew with brutal certainty, had any child in history been more alone. On that night, giants were felled. A dizzying void swallowed all that had once been but the trembling little girl could not succumb. She would be brave because her father had once told her that the world lived within her, that her bones were made of mountains, that rivers coursed through her veins, that her heartbeat was the sound of a thousand pounding hooves, and that her eyes glittered with the light of a starry sky. I am that girl and this is my story. So beautiful. The, the prologue every time, because I've read the novel, it's so filled with foreshadowing and meaning and themes and it's beautiful so for those of you who haven't read the novel yet I recommend after you finish reading it go back and reread the prologue because it's just it's it's beautiful it's beautiful thank you for sharing that Nadia so hard thank you Roger. <laughs> okay let's let's hear from the beauty of your face please so I'm also going to read from the beginning of the book um just to give a little bit of context it begins um in the present contemporary times with Athaf Rahman, the uh, main character um, who is confronted by a shooter who has entered her school building um, for which she is principal. And then we are swept back in time. So this is from the section when she is 10 years old in 1976, when her sister Neda has disappeared. She's the daughter of Palestinian immigrants. 22 days pass. Khalti Nisreen has gone back to her husband with the promise to return in a few days. Ammo Yahya came to the door to collect her. He didn't step inside, awkwardly apologizing to Baba. Ziyad and Amjad stop by in the evening when Baba is home, carrying Pyrex dishes full of mahshi and kufta their wives have prepared. A few of the Arabiyat around the neighborhood also drop by to comfort Mama, bringing a thermos of Sanka as though she is incapable of even brewing coffee. From a wire basket at the sink, they pull mugs that Afaf washes when she comes home from school. And between sips, the women shake their heads and suck their teeth. May Allah return her safely to you, Um Majid. Afaf's friend Samira visits with her mother and they play outside while Samira's mother washes bowls and glasses and Mama sits at the kitchen table, sobbing. Where could she have gone? Samira asks Afaf. Her friend's dark hair is cut in a short straight bob. 
Last summer, she crashed her bike into a rusty fence and a broken chain link sliced off the tip of her pinky. Afaf never tires of studying it, begging her friend to let her touch the smooth scar tissue. It looks like someone bit it off. Ever since, Samira is no longer allowed to ride a bike. Afaf had heard Samira's mother telling Mama about it. Shaipa, Shaipa, see what happens when you give a girl too much freedom in this country? She loses a finger. Luckily, it hasn't changed Mama's mind about Afaf riding her bike. Afaf turns the knob on her friend's Magna Doodle pad and shrugs her shoulders. I don't know where she went. They take turns drawing on the sketch pad, black grains assembling like ants beneath the screen. Afaf pulls the lever and Samira's fat rainbow and flowers disappear. She sketches a kitten with long whiskers. Afaf still desperately wishes for a pet but Mama refuses to have any four-legged creatures in their home. They have a fish tank, but the novelty has quickly worn off. Afaf wants an animal to hold and cuddle. Feeding indifferent fish is like any other chore she's expected to do around the apartment. I guess the police would have found her if she was hiding, Samira speculates, laying her chin on Afaf's shoulder as she draws. Why would she be hiding, dummy? Afaf doesn't intend to be cruel, but she wants to escape any talk of Meda, at least for a while. She turns a knob on the pad, trying to join two arcs to form a heart, but it ends up looking like an uneven inverted triangle. A young detective working the case buzzes the apartment one evening. Baba offers the detective a chair in the kitchen and Afaf and Majid watch from the doorframe of their parents' bedroom. He is very young, ruddy cheeks and blue eyes. His thick blonde hair, Parted on the side gives him the appearance of a schoolboy, not a homicide investigator. Detective Harold Jones. He shows her father his badge and turns it back into the pocket of his corduroy jacket. Someone phoned about a suspicious man near the old Union stockyard. His eyes dart between her parents. We investigated, and He turns toward Afaf and Majid. Yo, lad, Baba says softly. Go watch TV. They bolt to the front room and sit on the sofa bed. Afaf listens hard, catching parts of the detective's sentences. We investigated, Anne. A body. These photographs. Can you identify if it's your... A chair pushes back, Mama's low moaning. Are you sure it's not her, Mr. Rahman? Have any distinguishing marks? The moaning grows louder, then shuffling slippers. The bathroom door slams shut. Mama's vomiting becomes the only sound in the apartment. Afaf runs to the kitchen. The detective stands, gathering his photographs. Before he closes his folder, Afaf catches the image of an arm, badly bruised, and fingernails caked with dirt. I'm sorry about all this, he tells Baba. You should take comfort in the fact that she's still out there. We'll do our best to find her. The dead girl in the pictures turns out to be Bianca Lopez. 16 years old, gone missing a day before Neda. Afaf knows that it is almost worse for her parents, it not being Neda's body, battered and broken, because it means more waiting, more not knowing. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Sahar. Um, that, that part made me, you read made me think of something that I actually wanted to talk about uh, because of the line about how if you give a girl some freedom mm. she loses a finger which makes me laugh out loud every time <laughs> I read it because it is such a good um representation of what we what I've often heard here said especially like parent immigrant parents and so on just trying to make sure their their girls are not hurt you know by uh, by freedom because freedom is dangerous and um, and that's uh, it's it's actually an interesting uh, thing because both of your novels have these extremely strong uh, female characters, right? Who go through a lot, who uh, suffer a lot, but who are um, independent and who know how to deal with whatever life throws at them. And they're both Muslim, and they're both from ethnicities that are often subject to uh, stereotypes. And um, I was wondering how you both feel about that, um, about the stereotypes. Is that something that you keep in mind as you're writing? Is it a motive that, you know, pushes you to write these characters? 
are you just aware of it because you know that the reader has these stereotypes in the back of her head and may uh, in, you know, superimpose them on your characters? Like, how does this dynamic play out? And how do you feel about the importance of representation in those terms as well? So, Sahar, do you, do you want to start um, sure, talking about that? Sure. Um, well, you know what? That, that was exactly the impetus for this particular book. Um, it was inspired by the real life hate killings of three Muslim Americans in Chapel Hill. So I, I wanted to dispel those stereotypes surrounding the Muslim community, but particularly women like Athaf and visibly Muslim women, hijabi women. Um, so, yes, that, that was quite deliberate. Um, I, I wanted to uh, move away from the sensationalized headlines of, of hate crimes in this case. Um, and, and even, you know, bigotry um, in general. And, and, you know, I just, I wanted to present um, a human life, you know, um, but I knew that I would be combating those um, conceptions and, and those, and those, uh, um, told, you know, I think commonly um, told narratives. Uh, I didn't want to inflate any stereotypes with this book, um, and I and I hope I haven't. But um, you know, for sure, um, that that was one of my objectives. Yeah, to 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 say the least, because um, again, it was about presenting a community that has been often vilified and misunderstood. Um, has been feared and hated, uh, and and this was this was my chance for sure. And you you did an excellent job with it, and it's very difficult, I know, because you have this weight behind you of knowing that there are certain you know misconceptions out there, and that the readers will bring them to the book. So this you're not really starting from a blank slate, if that makes sense. Yeah. And, and it's also that, that, you know, the readers who are Muslim and, and Arab, um, I, I probably felt uh, the, the most pressure from that community as I was imagining them. Um, so, yeah. Yes. I understand that as well, because you're always afraid you're going to misrepresent something. And then, yeah, I understand that. I, I don't know if it's, if it's fair to feel that pressure, but, uh, but, I, but I know it exists. I'm, I'm definitely um, reconciling that. And, and, and I, I've learned to silence, you know, all critics just so, just so I can get my vision, you know, on the page. Well, excellent. N Nadia, how about you and, and your strong, independent little girl who grows into a strong, independent woman, uh, despite the incredible odds that she faces? You know, um, I, so I've been, I've been eager to hear how Sahar would answer this question, because I have to say, when I read The Beauty of Your Face, I remember thinking, whoa, this is not the character I expected. And I love that feeling, right? I did, whoa, I did not expect her to have that kind of past, to have that kind of, you know, that kind of history in her. But all those experiences had, had, had lined up to make her the very complex person that she is. So I, I love that. And I think that, Thank you. you know, having there's something so important about having our characters be people who have the space, who have the room to be, to be flawed, to be, you know, wild in some ways, to be wrong in some ways, to be bold, to be strong. I mean, all of that comes together in being a very dynamic and interesting character. Um, and that was what I wanted to create for, for Sitara. And in this story, it's really a young girl who, I mean, she experiences a, a incredibly traumatic event very early in her life. How does she climb out of that? How does she, you know, move forward with that? Well, I've seen a lot of people around me in our community and in, you know, neighboring kind of communities where people have had to plod forward after a significant trauma and a weight that they're still carrying. And how everyone does that is a little bit different. It just depends on the individual. And some people will kind of, you know, rise above that that traumatic history and and others will kind of be weighed down by it forever. And there's not there's not really a, like a right or wrong. It's just what kind of story do you want to record here? And, um, you know, for me, I wanted to create a character who was dynamic, exciting, um, troubled in some ways, but also someone that I wanted I wanted to keep my eye on and hopefully the reader would want to um, to keep watching as well. 
um, as a reader, I wanted to keep watching her. So I know the readers would would want that I as well. And and it, in terms of complex characters, you you both do this very very well and very skillfully, both for your main characters and for the minor characters as well, for the supporting cast of characters. I loved how. Um, um, Sitara and uh, her relationship with her parents and, you know, the other characters who pop up um, along the way, including the, the, the guard, and I don't want to reveal too much, like everyone is layered in ways. It's, there's never a black and white. There's never someone who's totally good and totally bad. And the same goes for Afaf in particular, who does have this very interesting past. And that's that's something when you when you um, saw her when you were talking about writing and keeping the Arab community in mind. That's something that, as I was reading, I was like, "Whoa, good for you, giving her that pass." <laughs> because I'm be telling you, I was reading. I was like, "Girl, she went there. Yeah. She went there." Yeah. And, <laughs> and luckily, the responses have been exactly that. Like, "Thank you for going there." This is yeah. a very familiar yeah. story that we just have not, you know, shared, you know, out loud. So, so that was cool. That's that's good. I'm glad you had that response because you know that was courageous of you to go there. And again, no spoilers, but very interesting character arc there uh, yes. and development. Um, well, and the other you you kind of touched on that, Nadia. But maybe you, if you can elaborate a little bit, and I I want to talk about this because both of your novels deal with very traumatic and violent events. Right? There is a main event where people die okay, in both of them. And it's and it sounds so traumatizing. It is traumatizing for the characters, obviously, on some level. Um, but, and there's also a traumatic childhood involved for both of them with the part that you read about Nada's disappearance, um, Sahar, and of course, what you mentioned about the, the, the coup that uh, Sitara witnessed as a child, Nadia. And yet your novels are not overwhelmingly sad at all, at all. I loved reading them. Um, I never felt that, okay, this is like too much and I can't, I just can't read this part. It was just, it's done so skillfully and so well and with such beauty, I felt like you both do this, that it's the, the, the violence or the violent event or the, the trauma that the characters go through is, is not at all uh, transferred to the reader in, in an unbearable way. And yet it still opens up um, questions and themes that you can think about and so on. And it still draws you to the character and it makes you want to know, makes the reader want to, to know what's going to happen to these characters. So can you talk a little bit about your choice to actually make um, a, a traumatic event the center of, of the novel and why you chose to do so and how you managed to still keep the, the, the novel um, I, I don't want to say lighter-hearted. They're not light-hearted in a way, but but they're just they're beautiful and they're uh, they're not um, overwhelming for the reader. How do, how do you do that, Nadia? Do you want to uh, talk about yours a little bit? Sure. So I had to start with the 1978 coup because that event was really what had inspired this novel. Um, you know, around my other books, I've engaged in conversations with with people who have read them and. And I have found that there's been a lot of um, kind of misunderstandings about Afghanistan's history, a lot of you know, lack of knowledge that Afghanistan used to be a very peaceful place where they had a thriving civil society and music and fashion shows and you know women graduating from professional schools and all of these amazing things that my parents grew up with and, and probably took for granted. Um, so I wanted to go back in time to the moment of history where it really you know, the, the thing that tipped Afghanistan over into what would be decades of conflict. And it was the 1978 coup and, you know, all of these Cold War tensions kind of coming to a head. So I wanted to talk about the responsibility that the world had in, in creating this, um, this like tinderbox in Afghanistan. And that's really what it was. But to tell that story, I needed to insert a character to help me to convey what, what, what happened there. And in my research, you know, what happened that night was that there was a coup in the palace and um, the president of the Afghanistan, his, his wife and several members of his family were, were murdered there. They were assassinated and the bodies were disappeared. And uh, you know, among the dead were four of his grandchildren, the youngest being 18 months old. It was that detail that really got me was, you know, uh, the children who happened to be there, who were these, innocent bystanders, bystanders of the this historic and, and, you know, brutal moment in the history of the country. And so I thought, 
I need a child to, to take us through because it is a traumatic event in her history. It's also a traumatic event in the country's history and something that is then, you know, carried forth. Um, I think when it comes to how do you package that trauma in a way that's still um, not, you know, that still can be tolerated by the reader and, uh, and not kind of, you know, turning people away from it. We take a look around us and we see people people, there are people in our lives every day who are carrying different kinds of trauma and, and they're not, you know, weighing us down when we talk, we're engaging with them. We probably don't even know, right? You've probably had a conversation with someone today who has a very traumatic history and, and we don't know it. It's because people are somehow able in some ways to compartmentalize, to, you know, hide what, what is going on in their heads, in their hearts, and they're able to carry, carry through I think it also speaks to, you know, what kind of empathy should we be having in our everyday? Because we just never know. We never know what people are bringing to the conversation and, you know, what they're bringing to every interaction. So um, I'm hopeful. And I'm hopeful for everybody who has been through trauma and hopefully do it in a way that is respectful of that trauma and to not impose upon them any shoulds or coulds or woulds, but rather honor the, the journey that everyone has. It's, it's, that's beautiful. I, I love the, the emphasis on, on empathy. And, and I love that you chose to have a child take us through this. And I particularly loved all her time at the palace, because you, you, you do contextualize that experience, that time of her life so well, before the violence starts. And it makes it, um, it, it, it makes it easier for the reader to visualize what happened, obviously, but you also understand her tie to the place more. And so it's not just about her family, it's about the losses that she's going through. Like, and, and it's just, it's, it, was, it was beautifully done, beautifully done. And she's a brilliant little child too. So, so thank you for, for, for doing this. Um, Sahar, how about you? And you have, you have two things. You have the traumatic um, kind of event in her childhood and then the, the present time uh, school shooter. Event. Yeah. And I just want to say too, yeah, just how powerful um, a child character is and how that really just disarms readers, especially if they are readers who are not familiar with a particular community. I think any fiction just invites you in, you know, I think it's, it's an act of empathy, writing it and then reading it, you know, this is, this is the power of fiction. And, and, you know, just, just to um, echo what, what Nadia was saying about carrying trauma, that's what I'm interested in. So yes, there's the shooting, that, that is the seed. But I didn't want that to be the heart of this book. And I think people are really just surprised when they pick it up and they start to read it because they're like, wait a second, this only focuses, I mean, we start in the present, and, but then we're swept back because what I'm interested in are what are those stories that we carry? So what, what are our origin stories? Where are we coming from? What are the choices we're making? What are those forces that basically carry us to this, this really critical moment in time? So what are those stories of trauma? And we just don't know them, I think, in life, unless we ask someone, where are you coming from? You know, where have you been? And um, that, that is how I was, I hope, you know, I was able to make that really awful um, shooting for lack of a better word, palatable, right? And manageable for, for readers. Um, because, you know, the, the shooter is also presented, as you know, um, in very, very um, yeah, um, sort of distilled um, chapters. But he reminds the audience of that present violence. And I didn't want an audience forgetting that. So I did want, you know, that, that sense of danger, you know, to, to certainly um, be present and, and carry through. But in the end, um, it, it really is about um, this human being, Afaf, and, uh, you know, everything she's been through that has, you know, shaped her, um, the disappearance of her sister, uh, a father who's an addict, a mother who, you know, slowly um, is deteriorating mentally, right? And so it's a really fractured family. So those are all the, the things that we don't get to hear about um, when we get when these horrible events happen in real life, right? And, and so again, you know, I just talk about, you know, removing um, just the numbers, the, the victimhood, I guess, the sensationalism of, of these really horrible, uh, you know, horrendous hate crimes and presenting, you know, actual human lives. And, 
that that's what I always have written for, for, for sure. You know, I'm just always curious about, um, again, you know, where, where, where we've come from, um, and how that informs the present, you know, and, and, and there are things of course that, that, uh, we are constantly battling against that are not in our control, but certainly choices that we make. And we see that with Afaf, especially when she's a teenager, making very destructive choices. And that's appealing to me. Okay, Sahar, that's, that's really fascinating because I'm, I'm listening to both of you talk. And I was, we were talking earlier about how you manage to write about violence and then make your novels so readable. And I should have caught on that because I'm a writer but part of that is you create such excellent tension and it's just so suspenseful reading both your novels I want to know what's going to happen to you know uh, Hafaf and Nada and her and, and so much of it is set in in like Hafaf's childhood growing up and I want to know what's going to happen to uh, Sitara and how she's you know going to survive all of this so part of it is just that you are so seeped into these day-to-day -day details and emotions and what's happening to your characters that is just impossible to put the books down, I think. And that's that's one of the things probably. But um, speaking of that, and you had men you've mentioned uh, families, uh, Sahar, and both of your novels also have very interesting mother-daughter relationships, mother-father relationships, just parental relationships and uh, mother figures. It, it's just, it's fascinating with Afaf and her mother who is almost dysfunctional in a way, I think, if I can say that. Um, and uh, and then we have uh, Sitara who loses her biological parents, but then she has mother figures uh, as well. And she has this very loving father. There are so many mentions of uh, Sitara's father and he's always quoting poetry to her, which I love. <laughs> like the man is just is just singing and quoting poetry. It's just, it's amazing. And Afaf's fa father as well, who is a flawed character for sure, but also very kind. So can you both talk a little bit about um, why you chose to make these relationships the way they are and how they helped you, if they did help you uh, kind of create the characters of the protagonists them themselves? Like Sahar, do you want to talk about that? Sure. Um, I really loved writing Baba, um, Mama Muntaha. She was actually probably the most challenging. People think that it's the shooter and it's not. Um, uh, this, this is also, I think, um, a relationship that might also be surprising for readers. Um, and I think Baba was too, because um, unfortunately, I think we, we, we might be um, slapped with, you know, just really oppressive Arab Muslim men and fathers and, you know, did not want to at all, um, again, inflate that. It was so gratifying to write someone like Baba, who, as you said, is incredibly flawed and it's an incredibly dysfunctional family. Um, and he just, he represents so many beautiful things. Uh, so, you know, there, there, there's the daily um, absence of Nada, which is, you know, effectively a presence, right? That that haunts them. And so Baba, I think, manages to infuse beauty through his music, through his kindness. And then I think Mama too, you know, at, you know, with their food, I would say, you know, that 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 and the comfort of that. But you know, in presenting um, a human story, I'm I'm interested in these kind of um, dysfunctional, complicated relationships because it's those relationships that shape us. You know, that, you know, th this is who we become later on in life. Uh, of course, we might make, I think, very deliberate choices to not carry on maybe patterns um, and to carry maybe you know some of these destructive, um, you know, legacies and so on, but. Uh, I, I was interested in, you know, what happens um, in a family when the mother is impaired? So what happens, you know, um, to that particular figure who really, I think, tends to be the heart, you know, of, of, of most families? And, you know, how does that then trickle down to children? And in this case, I'm, I, I just really love writing about mother-daughter relationships as much as I do father-sons, and I've done that in, in other stories. Um, but you know, I also wanted to, I think, tackle mental health, which, you know, is another um, subject that I, I don't know that I've gotten to read a lot about, you know, um, in, in my immediate communities. And so that felt, you know, really good. And um, again, something that was 
maybe familiar, but never talked about. So it was actually new along with, you know, some of the other, you know, experiences that, that um, I present with Hotbath. Um, so yeah, it just, it, you know, this relationship was just one more way of, uh, you know, presenting a very nuanced, you know, world to readers, you know, so, um, and, 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 and that was really cool to, to write difficult for sure. But, um, you know, I, I, I hope, uh, you know, mama was, I hope I, I done her justice. I know she is not always likable, but she is certainly someone who for me was very sympathetic. I, I agree. I agree. She's, she's definitely not very likable, but I, but I never hated her. Really. Oh, good. Yeah. You, know, it's, it's, you, you feel more sorry for her than anything. Yeah. Sorry for FF, obviously. I know some of my readers were not forgiving. I was like in a book club with a multi-generational family and, and the matriarchs in this family <laughs> were like, no excuse. You know, she should have, you know, not neglected her kid. But then the younger women were like, wait a second, grandma, like, let's look at her life. Let's look at her marriage. Let's look at her losses. So uh, it, that that is really gratifying, you know, those those kinds of conversations around her. That's interesting because there's probably also a generational difference difference in our attitude toward mental health issues as well. Yes. So that's yeah. probably why the younger women were for sure. Yeah. Cut her some slack. Yeah. Well, N Nadia, how about you? Uh, there's a line that I read and I looked for it again and I and I went for it and without spoilers, we're not going to mention who anyone is. But Tilly tells Sidora it's about um, uh, and, and Antonia right? That uh, it's, it's not you. It's all, it's me. It's always been me that she's angry with her. So there's this, there's a, there, there's this little, you, you both put such little subtle details in there and it just makes me want to like go back and read the whole book and look for, for more, uh, for more cues like these. But there's also these, these very complex mother daughter relationships. Um, there is, um, you know, a, 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 a sense of there's an absence as well. Uh, but then there's there's love and support. So so how did you build all of that into um, your your characters? Yeah. So I think like like Sahar was just mentioning in that that group where she was talking in the multi generational discussion. You know these characters are uh, are meant to do what they're doing. They're not meant to do what we would want them to do or what the reader would want them to do if they were a friend of theirs who'd be sitting where you'd be counseling them like don't treat your children this way and make sure you spend extra time talking to your daughter and be supportive and all those kinds of things. This is not meant to be that. This is meant to be a reflection of, of individuals who are really grappling with their situations, you know, bringing forward their own histories and, and flaws in the way that they were raised and then perpetuating some cycles and then, you know, gaining some insight along the way, but just really being completely imperfect about it. And I think, um, and that's what I wanted to convey in the relationship between between Tilly and Antonia. So Tilly is this um, is her her mom who has come to visit her. Antonia is the American woman who is stationed in Kabul and she works at the embassy and she is very responsible. She's a hard worker and she's really kind of, you know, fought her way. She's become very independent. And especially as a woman in the foreign service at that, at that time, a woman had to be pretty independent and strong to, to hold that kind of position, which was a whole lot of research that was very intriguing into what the, what the state department was like for, for women at that time. But she's got this mom who was not there for a lot of her childhood, who was more, you know, flighty and, 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 you know, into the theater. And so completely different personalities and a lot of clashes, a lot of history between them that I think is, is coming through in, in what's happening. And yet even through that in, in their time together, when Sitara falls into their lap, they have to work together. And all of a sudden they're seeing the, each other, they're seeing the world, they're seeing their priorities um, and their rationale about what to do next, you know, with each other in mind, but it's all centered around this girl and it sort of, you know, removes their history from them and they're able to put their energies into doing something together. So I think that's, you know, the, the interesting part is always exploring where did a relationship go wrong? Is it salvageable? 
what could possibly bring two people who have who have grown to just be annoyed at the sound of each other's voices, um, what could possibly bring them together again? And uh, and and it's always really interesting and intriguing to explore those moments. That's 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 fascinating, and and you 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 both again such complex relationships and beautiful characters. So it's, it's it was a joy to read. Um, I, I want to, I have, have way more questions, but I did promise that I will ask you guys, um, lady, ladies, um, a question, two questions that um, come from a um, college student's classroom. So Nadia, the Montgomery College students in comparative politics and world literature have read your novel. And they came up with a whole list of questions for you. And we picked two that um, I want to ask you both, actually, because they, they are di directed to Nadia, but they can also apply to your novel, Sahar. So, uh, and they're, very, they're excellent questions. So, um, so I want to get to those. Um, the first one is um, Nadia writes in the author's note that she leaned into my personal experience more for Ariana than perhaps any other character I've written. And they're asking, would, you, would she provide more details about that? So this is about um, you know, how much of your personal um, life you've put into Ariana. And then Sahar will we'll get to your novel as well with the same question. So Nadia? Yeah. So it is a, it's a good question. Um, and thanks to, I'm glad this class is, is reading the book. Thank you for reading it. And I'm happy to connect with you guys offline too. This, this is a novel where, you know, in none of my books do I want to create a character who is meant to reflect me or my priorities or my experiences. It's not it's not meant to do that. But this story is one in which I wanted to explore the Afghan American experience. And the Afghan American experience, especially of my generation, is really kind of defined by before and after 9-11. And, um, and it just so happens that I was in training. I was in, you know, first year of medical school in Brooklyn on 9-11. And so so being present for for that moment where we went from being largely anonymous to all of a sudden a lot of attention focused and a lot of questions um, hovering around Afghan Americans um, by extension because of their connection with Afghanistan to to feel that discrepancy in what it meant to be an, an American uh, was something I wanted to explore in this book was like the journey of of this immigrant population. But you can only explore that through an individual. So, so I leaned into my experience as as being a Afghan American physician in New York City on that day. But the rest of her, you know, how she reacted to that day, what happened to her on that day, um, what it triggered in her mind, all of that is her, and it was not meant to be me in any way because that would be disingenuous to the character and not do her justice. So, um, and I think there is so much to explore in, in the evolution of an immigrant population, you know, like what are they, what are the pieces of music? And that's what I wanted her to, to think about, you know, what are the pieces of music that make her think of home? What are the, what are like the little shreds, the little, the little tidbits that take her back to that time? And what are the things that she feels like very, very American about? And none of that is, is done in anybody's life, I think, in a way where you're thinking, you know, this is the thing that reminds me of Afghanistan and, and on Tuesdays, I'm American, you know, all of it is like seamless and blended and, and whole in our experiences. And, um, and hopefully that's what I was able to um, portray. Perfect, perfect. Sahar, how about you and Afaf or any other characters in your novel? Is any of it based on you or someone you know? Um, so I want to echo this idea of uh, experience. In my case, it would be the Arab American, the Muslim American experience for sure. Um, so it is entirely fictional, but I'll say that there are, you know, some details that come from um, stories, uh, experiences. Some of them are anecdotal. Some I've actually engaged in, like, for example, the hijab party. So some of those things definitely seeped in. And even when Neda disappears, that's, that is an experience um, that I carried from, from the um, early 80s when I was a child, hearing about, you know, more than one incident of, uh, you know, Arab girls um, disappearing, running off. So inevitably, you know, those crept in and probably more in this book than in anything I've, I've written, you know, for sure. 
Uh, but I, but I love what Nadia says about it, you know, had it been about me, it would be disingenuous. Um, I love that Afaf serves, um, she's my buffer. So, you know, I can explore these things and it not be about me, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and uh, it's so great to even be able to fictionalize the town and not have people call you to account and with details. And 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 I actually picked up that tip from Susan Mahadi Daraj, who does not like give like historical, especially Palestinian villages. I'm like, Good job, Susan. That that's exactly right. Um, because you know, I, I it's the story you know that 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 I want to maintain control over. So um, certainly uh, things that I have carried for sure. But um, you know, if 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 I'm like any of these characters, I am probably like Majid, who is like the straight arrow, the one who follows all the rules. And people laugh when I say that. I'm like. Not as colorful as I have. So when we get to the teenage years, that was rough for me to write. You know, um, that was uh, probably the greatest act of, of empathy. And uh, so and then, of course, you know, there, there were experiences like Hedge, which I have not experienced. Um, and and to have to do research for those was incredible. But um, I always made sure that I was um, spending time with my characters first before even getting into, you know, the, the research aspect of it, because um, I just I didn't want, you know, these characters and, and places to become really just contrived and sort of textbooky and, and that kind of thing. Um, and, and, I, and I'll say this, by the way, Raja, and I don't know um, how Nadia feels about this. It, it's one of those questions, right, depending on the space that I am that sometimes um, I push back against because I think there's also this need, particularly like uh, maybe for, for non-Arab and non-Muslim um, audiences in, uh, related uh, to this book and, and to myself who want it to be autobiographical, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it's, it's kind of that fascination, I think, with trauma, someone uh, you know, I heard the the word like trauma porn last year when the pandemic first hit about a particular book that came out. And I thought, Ooh, that's really interesting. Um, and then just, you know, writers who are constantly asked, you know, that question, but not about anything else, like in terms of like craft and things that are authorly and writerly, you know, but that, that's not to say that I don't absolutely appreciate the question here, but again, you know, it's, it's, you know, I think that the different spaces, you know, that, that, that I, I sort of have been traveling in and it's fun to be able to say, I did that. Yeah. And this is based on, you know, so-and-so, but um, yeah. Yeah. I, I think my, my experience has been if the protagonist is the same gender and a similar age as you, people it's want you. to know if it's you because yeah. Yeah. my first novel had a 17 year old boy as a protagonist and I never got that question. And my second novel, I get it every time. Oh, sure. <laughs> because it's a woman and she's, uh, you know, my age. Yeah. So, I've gotten so that a lot actually with this one, people, um, they actually don't ask me if it's my story, but I've had a bunch of people tell me that they thought it was a memoir until, you know, a certain point in the book. And I wonder if it's also because it's first person. And I mean, it's written as if it were, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, she is telling her story from the first chapter on. It doesn't sound so much like the prologue, but but yeah, I think people do assume that if you are writing about, you know, a culture that seems a bit other, mm -hmm. that you must have walked that path exactly because there is one path there and that's the one that you're writing about. And I think that's why, you know, when you talked about how her father recites poetry to her, that's probably because I wanted to, I wanted to not write about a horrible Afghan man who beats his daughter and his wife and is just, you know, oppressing all the women around him, because that is not what I see all the time. It's not what I see in my life. It's not what I see in my family. So it's nice to be able to, you know, spread the wings a little bit. It is. It is. Well, I'm, I want to get to their second question because I don't, I, I, I want to keep on going for another half hour, but I don't think <laughs> we can. Um, I have so many more questions. Um, so the, the, from the, the same class, the Montgomery College students in comparative politics and world literature, the second question, on page 400, Ariana says to mom, I didn't come here to do a post-mortem on the Cold War. I came here to find my family. This scene seems to in encapsulate so much of Hashimi's writing, capturing the personal stories within sweeping historical events. Could Nadia speak a bit about how she came to write these types of stories? What has led her to tell these deeply personal stories within the sweeping historical events? So, 
Um, you know, you, sometimes people quote a line and I'm like, hmm, I wrote that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was a while ago, but, um, but I could see why I would, why I would write that because why is history significant? Any historic event is only significant because of the impact that it has on individual lives, right? So any, any war, any battle, any, anything that you would read about in a historic textbook, which is, you know, big and dry and, and heavy, is only, it only matters because of what it did to human beings along the way. And I think that's what historical fiction can do. I think that's what fiction can do is help us understand context, help us understand what policy does help us understand what you know an economic situation does what poverty does to a family what what revolution does um and that's why i choose to do this it's to explain first of all like the international dynamics in the world what the cold war's impact was because it's very easy to say the cold war was a bloodless war and, and had you know no real effect and yet here this country has been laid to waste because of the cold war um, but you can only know that when you walk through an individual's life and feel it directly because people have felt it directly. So that's why I choose to write these stories. I'm not a historian, but I am pretty obsessed with the impact of history and hopeful that the more we understand that connection, the more thoughtful we will be about our decisions today. Wonderful. Uh, Sahar, how about you? And you're not writing about, you know, the a coup like like uh, like Nadia has, but you are writing also in the context of post 9 11 Islamophobia yeah. and other. So, so can you uh, address the same uh, question? Yeah, um, and that was just so beautifully said, uh, Nadia. I really appreciate that. Um, I'll I'll uh, refer to that chapter without giving too much away uh, when it is post 9-11 and, and Afaf wants to go to Hajj. So she wants to go to the pilgrimage and 9-11 has occurred just a few months before. Um, I remember a very close friend of mine, a, a white classmate from high school who messaged me and said, I had no idea. I had no idea that this, is, this was the experience of Muslim people. And can I tell you, I that just hit me, you know, at my core, because uh, I think that, you know, th this is what I hope to do is to take these kinds of events, to take history and to, you know, re reveal and, or at least, and, and remind maybe um, readers that there are human beings, you know, who have suffered. There are human beings who are going to um, have to deal with the consequences as, as Nadia was saying. Uh, so, and, and, you know, when this book came out, we were already in the Trump, and then we had um, those awful New Zealand, the, the mosque shooting at, at Christchurch, and it almost felt like it was foretelling these things. But I think, uh, you know, a book like this, again, is, you know, is going to move us from the headlines, from the numbers, and again, present, uh, you know, the journey after, you know, the aftermath, you know, and, and how we carry on. Um, and, and, and that, that it has always been quite satisfying. I think, um, I've also felt a responsibility, you know, too. Um, and I, I also want to convey that this is a single person's experience. So, you know, we talk about the general, like Arab and Muslim experience or the Afghan American experience and so on. And, you know, I, I, I always tell, you know, readers in, in, in um, spaces like this, please don't let this be the last book that you read. Don't let mine be the last one. So go ahead and read then another one by a Palestinian American, by a Muslim American and, and, you know, get their take, you know, and, and maybe it's going to be about 9-11 too, but what was that particular experience about, you know, and, and, and I hope, I hope that that is what my book ends up doing. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. I mean, you, you both wrote beautiful books. I understand what you're saying, Sahar, about it being one experience. And I, I, I like to emphasize that as well. It's not a universal experience. It's never a universal experience, but it's definitely an experience worth sharing. Yes, and that yeah. will be so uh, illuminating, I think, both of your, book, your novels for anyone who uh, chooses to read them. So um, before we, because I think we're running out of time, unfortunately, I had more questions, but we're running out of time. So uh, I, I want to ask you one thing for my personal benefit. 
tell me how much you revised the novels because I need to know that I'm not alone in this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, our, you know, Raja, I think you are a really intense reviser, aren't you? I, am. I think I've I am. heard you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, Sahar, do you, do you do that as well? Do you revise you know, all of it? Do you just like, you know, is it the first draft and that's it? Oh, no. In fact, I'll, I'll say this. Um, uh, I've stopped calling my first draft a failed one. I call it an exploratory draft, which sounds so much better because... You know, had I not written that first draft, which had multiple characters and was just not working, you know, and I sulked after I put it away, you know, and then I had the the realization that it'd have to be one character that I had to home in on. Um, so I'll say this, uh, you know, that the I definitely revised um from agent to editor and then editor to final publication. Mm -hmm. And those have been wonderful. You know, there were some things that happened that, you know, I'll tell certain, you know, book club members and readers and, and they're like, Oh my gosh. And thank goodness you didn't go that route and things <laughs> like that. And I, and I won't say them here, but um, I'll say this about revision. I think, uh, you know, th this particular book has entered the world at I think it's very best. So I'm so happy that this is what ended up. There was nothing about this book that I regret, that I felt pressure to change. So, um, you know, all, the revision experience was just wonderful. And my, and my editor is also a poet. And I know that really, you know, I really benefited from that. Um, so I'll say this too, that I'm a fast writer and, you know, I, I can get through, you know, maybe a full draft and then, you know, it, it, it'll, it'll definitely travel through, through multiple drafts. Um, and who knows when, you know, that there's that moment when you say, you know, it's done. That's when a good agent, a good editor, you know, will, will enter the conversation. Right. And, and I had a really great journey with this book. Excellent. Excellent. Nadia, how about you? Um, so I'm always glad to hear other writers talk about the struggle of revisions and drafts and all of that because I think, you know, I came, I came from the world of just being a reader and I still feel like I'm just coming out of the world of just being a reader. And so you pick up a book and you assume that the writer sat down and wrote it in its most perfect form and then it, you know, just magically appears in the world. Um, and it's not the case. Right? <laughs> so I'll say that this this book went through a couple of yeah, I did go through a couple of early drafts where I was trying to figure out I kind of um, liken it to figuring out where to like I know the story, but where do you position the cameras to be able to to capture that story? Like an early draft of this one, I actually was looking to explore it from the two perspectives of Sitar as a young girl girl and then also from Antonia's perspective as an American woman working in Afghanistan at the time of a very unexpected coup where it goes from this party post to you know all of a sudden the world is upside down and it is something about it wasn't clicking and, and that was with me and my my agent kind of working at it and she gives really incredible advice aside from finding titles for me uh, <laughs> so she said focus on the girl and when I started doing that it was sort of like, you know, you could quiet everything else and figure out still how to incorporate the American perspective through what you're, what this little girl is observing um, in her interactions with Antonia and with Tilly and with other people, but to be able to focus in on her and not really be distracted by having to, to jump around. Um, so there are, so there was that, you know, in the drafting and then the revisions and every time they co they send it back and, and they say, okay, now it's time for the, the line editing. Like I always forget with every book, how many times it comes back to me. Right? <laughs> and then I think, well, this is going to take me a couple of days because I've been through this so many times. And then every time I'm like, but you know what, let me just go through it line by line. And every time I'm like, who wrote this trash? <laughs> Uh, How possibly arrange, but uh, you know, at some point I found that I have started to write a sentence in, you know, form A, the next draft, I'll write it in form B and then the revisions come back again. I switched it to, to back to like form A and, and then I think, you know what, it actually doesn't matter as much as I think it does. <laughs> so, so you, it's, you have to kind of like draw the line at some point and say, this is it, this is its best form. And anything else I'm doing at this point is, is really just like, you know, driving myself crazy and everybody else along with me. So <laughs> well, deadlines well, are good because it makes yes. you just stop 
hand it in and and it's done. So I try to respect deadlines as much as possible. I, I need deadlines as well. And the, both your novels definitely are their best forms and they were a joy to read. Um, so and unfortunately, I think we're out of time. So I'm going to wrap it up. I want to thank you both so much. That was a personal pleasure for me to get to talk to both of you to, uh, today. And I want to thank the Gaithersburg Book Festival again for making this happen and for giving us a chance to uh, to hear you talk about your wonderful novels and to connect uh, during the, the pandemic when it's sometimes very difficult to do so. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Likewise, you. it's such a joy, Sahar and Such Raj. a joy. Yes, Nadia, thank you, Rajya. And thank you to the festival. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank you for joining us today for this presentation. We have an amazing lineup of author presentations taking place right here throughout the month of May. You don't want to miss them. Go to GaithersburgBookFestival.org and look over the schedule so you can plan the rest of your festival month. And now here is an important message from renowned author and independent bookstore owner, Ann Patchett and her dog, Sparky. Enjoy everyone. I'm Ann Patchett here at Parnassus Books with my dog, Sparky. And I wanna tell you the importance of supporting your local independent bookstore, Politics and Prose. They are a remarkable partner with this book festival. Now, when a book festival is live, it's really easy. You just go to the table and you buy your book and then you go to the event. But when a book festival is virtual, it gets a little trickier because you're home and you might think, well, you know, I'll just buy the book on Amazon. So I'm here to tell you, don't buy the book on Amazon. For one thing, Jeff Bezos has enough money, right? He's trying to colonize the moon or something. He doesn't need anything that you've got. Politics and Prose, on the other hand, they're your local independent bookstore and you love them and they bring you so many events. They work harder than any bookstore I know in their community. And if you want them to be there alive and healthy and well when all this is over, you actually need to support them. They are the people that are putting a tax base in your community, okay? So you have teachers and police officers and firefighters and when you pay a couple dollars more for a book, you're creating jobs in your community. So enjoy your book festival, support politics and prose. Remember, Ann Patchett and Sparky think it's the thing to do. Shop local, thank you.